I'm Kenneth Bowles, Design Advisor at the ICO, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to Privacy Seriously. This is part of an ongoing series of events and support that the ICO is offering to designers, product managers, engineers, and our theme today is how to do great work in the real world of technology teams. We've got two fantastic keynotes and two expert panels for you today. And I'm particularly excited uh, by this event because we had overwhelming interest uh, in the event. It blew right past our expectations. So it's, it's great to see such a strong appetite for privacy discussion among our friends and our peers in industry. So I really hope you enjoy the afternoon. A couple of logistical points before we start. We will have breaks between the sessions. The timings of those will appear on the slides between sessions, so you'll know when you need to come back. I suggest that you just stay connected to the event between sessions so you avoid any potential hassles when trying to rejoin. Most of the sessions will include a little time for questions as well. If you would like to propose a question, then please use the live Q&A box that you should see on the right hand side of your screen. We'll review those questions and we'll pick some to ask to pose to our speakers and panelists. If you want to post about the event on social media, please obviously feel free to do that. Uh, we suggest using the hashtag privacy seriously. And finally, we are recording the event. Recordings are going to be available uh, for around a week or so after the event. We'll send you an email with all the details once the event concludes. So let's get right now to our opening keynote, Robin Burgeon. Robin has 20 years of experience working on open human-centric systems. He's currently head of governance and standards at Protocol Labs. And before that, he spent five years leading the New York Times' privacy team. He's also the editor of the W3C's Privacy Principles. And today, Robin's going to talk to us about a subject that's particularly dear to my heart, how privacy is a product issue. So please welcome Robin. Hi, and welcome. Thank you for joining today's Privacy Seriously event, and many thanks to the ICO for inviting me to present. Uh, the basic idea that I want to bring to you today is that the way in which we all tend to do privacy um, isn't setting any one of us up for success. And uh, we can improve our practices by approaching them differently without necessarily uh, requiring changes to regulation. Uh, I don't think that the idea that how we tend to do privacy isn't working great is contentious, uh, but there's a fair bit less agreement uh, about how we could go about changing our ways to address the problems that we can all see. The approach I'm advocating has a thin veneer of provocation, but uh, I think the underlying ideas are, are, are serious. Uh, the way in which we implement privacy in digital products today leads to bad experiences for our users, which we, we all know. Um, it makes our products less trusted. Um, it sidelines our compliance colleagues, uh, making them less effective and, and frankly, many of us miserable in doing that. Um, it leads tech, data, advertising, marketing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, people to, to basically carry out what they feel um, is make work, um, and that often prevents them from engaging productively uh, with, with, with the topic at hand. Um, it also just isn't delivering much real world improvement to how people's data is processed at the end of the day. Um, so I'd like to suggest that that there is a different way to do this that, that can work better. better. Um, basically, you know, a, a, a change of focus in, in how we approach the problem. I know that I'm not the only one to, to have experimented with it, but I, I do think it needs to be more broadly considered. So throughout this talk, I'm going to make really broad statements about lawyers or somewhat interchangeably in this case, compliance people. I want to be extra clear that I have worked with some great people in the field and forged wonderful partnerships um, with people who are still my friends today, even though even though we've we've left the company and and, and no longer work to, together. Um, my argument really is about how we organize privacy work in, in in a way that is completely centered on legal compliance, as if that were the only thing to understand about privacy. Um, I'm not going to tell you that compliance doesn't matter, um, but 
rather than making it the only or even the most important part of your privacy strategy will likely lead you to make bad products and bad business decisions. I've met dozens of, of, of people who work in, in, in privacy compliance, if not more, um, and overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly um, most of them uh, you know, really got into it because they want to bring better privacy to real people. Um, but just like everyone else, uh, if they are set up to work in a way that paints them into a corner, um, they are set up to fail. And I think that is what we need to change for, for, for all of us. So what really is the problem here? What, what, what is it about the current state of privacy that makes it appealing to at least think about how we could do it um, differently? Trying to go through a list of all the problems with personal data in digital systems, or, or even just the, the biggest ones, I would take all day if, if, if I tried to do it comprehensively. Um, that, however, won't, won't be necessary. Um, my focus here isn't on solving every last problem, um, but rather on showing that the problems with the compliance-centric approach to privacy are widespread and well-known. Um, I think you know what the problems are there, I don't think that, that you're going to be shocked by, by anything that, that I'm listing here. And so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the list of problems to, to, to a rather uh, short uh, minimum. One thing that's important when designing a product is to think about imperfect cases and about people who are, who are not going to act accordingly to you know, some kind of ideal, uh, but more like real world people. Um, if, I, if I remember correctly, uh, Kenneth actually talks about this in, in his book, Future Ethics, which I highly recommend. Um, cookie consent feels like the regulation was designed with ideal people in mind. Um, you know, people who will, who will know that there, there's a law and therefore act like good citizens and, and help the data subjects, uh, subjects consent properly. Um, the truth is that relying on businesses to craft just the right user interface to com convey you know really complex information and get like proper agency in the consent in return is is, is simply not going to work uh, uh, you know you, you you would need to marry that with a way of, of enforcing it very credibly and in this I feel like the the regulatory design itself uh, could do with a bit more product thinking. It, it, it probably would help in, the, in this case. Uh, nevertheless, I, it feels like we ought to be able to do better than, than this sort of like cookie cutter compliance. <laughs> Unless, of course, you really don't want to solve the problem. Throughout this talk, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working from the assumption that, that product people are more or less trying to make a great experience that works in favor of the user, but evidently we, we, we all know that that's not always the case and every field has its evil geniuses. Um, and clearly the, the, the designer who worked on uh, creating this interface to, to the TCF has a very bright future in the, in the dark arts. Uh, jokes aside, even real world privacy practices can be quite funny. Um, at some point, the New York Times ran 150 privacy policies through a legibility, uh, legi I can never say this word, readability scoring algorithm, and uh, the results were hilarious. Um, the reading comprehension level for the majority of these privacy policies matched that at which a university degree is required, or worse. Um, the ranking found that many privacy policies were harder to read than the first chapter of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. And the article didn't specify whether that was in the original German or not, but at this stage, I think it's fair to say it doesn't matter. Um, I think only the BBC came out looking good. And, and in fact, one of the things I, I, I really uh, enjoyed about this piece is that they, they did it right. And so they included the New York Times' own privacy policy in the ranking. And of course, it scored terrible. Um, not the worst by, you know, by any margin, but uh, worse than, say, Facebook. Um, and yes, it was worse than Kant in both readability um, and length. So, you know, that, that, that specific piece uh, was actually key in convincing people that we ought to improve the writing of the policy. Um, and that on its own is already an important takeaway uh, to understand is like, 
when you're trained to deal with this kind of document, um, and, you know, and, and you do it every day for, for years and years, you, you might completely lose sight of um, just how impenetrable and, and poorly uh, written uh, it is. It, this is not English, it's legalese, it's, it's literally a separate language. Um, and, and lawyers who don't see the problem are not acting in, in bad faith. Um, they've just lost the ability to see the text uh, the way a lay person um, does. And that makes it hard for them to fix the problem in the first place. So that's already somewhere where partnership, um, a stronger partnership and, and direction from the product side can, can help. And of course, uh, we all know that all these legal processes are doing far too little to bring data processing in line with what people actually expect and what they want. Um, uh, you know, data is very personal. People actually do care, uh, and we're treating it as, as collateral damage. Uh, you'd be surprised, maybe, at how many people notice this. Um, they're not, you know, they're not noticing every day. They're not obviously noticing on, on every page load. You, you couldn't do that, uh, but they do notice. Uh, maybe someone recommended that they installed, you know, this kind of this or that extension um, that shows them uh, what's going, you know, s some idea of, of what's going on in the page. Um, but, y you know, uh, people do notice and it, it takes a toll on, on how they trust, uh, you know, the digital space and, and our, our products. And the feedback I've seen is, isn't coming from, from you know, Linux on the desktop nerds. It, it's mostly from curious people who, who just wanted to know. Um, and a lot of the time they, they convey just how disappointed they are that, you know, one of, the, one of their favorite sites is, is, is carrying out these practices. Um, they, feel, they feel like, like the, 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 the products we, we build are backstabbing them. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't think we should be mincing words when we face the, the, the situation we're in. You know, uh, you can point to all the bureaucratic processes you want that are supposed to help with privacy. Uh, the stuff we're building is still just like plain, downright deceptive to people. They don't, they don't think that's what's happening, and we're still doing it to them. I could go on with these issues, but I know that I don't need to. We all know it's a mess out there. Um, and perhaps the most surprising fact about many of these issues is that it isn't highly controversial that they are problems. We all know this. We, you know, we've, we've all seen this. We, we use the internet as well. And uh, I don't think I've ever met anyone involved in making user, uh, you know, any kind of user facing product or even who, who just uses the internet as well, who, who thinks that any of this is, is, is good or helpful or, or working. And yet it still happens. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Uh, why? Uh, you know, it, it, it's as if we've, we've collectively agreed that the whole situation of how we process, you know, people's data and, and surface their rights to them is absolutely terrible. But, uh, you know, this is fine. Of course, you know, this could, could be enforced against, but we've all seen over the past five years in particular, that enforcement is limited. Um, DPAs have tiny budgets compared to the to the size of the of the task at hand, um, and and you know the the impact they can have from that budget is is often you know pretty 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 small, um, as much as we might like it to to, to be more, um, you know. And so we could we could all sit on our thumbs and wait for things to magically improve, or maybe wait for the those budgets to grow, which which seems unfortunately unlikely. Uh, but my contention here is that we actually can do better and we should do better um, without it having to be done at gunpoint. And so, uh, so long as we stick to, to, to the belief and, and, and you know, that, that narrative that the only reason you would want to do any privacy work is to stay out of trouble, um, we're going to be doing a bad job of it. That's, that's just not the right, the right motivation, I think. It's not the right approach. If the work is, is basically all about writing some DPIAs or a few LIAs and, you know, uh, activating some perfunctory process like, you know, like consent banners, why would anyone want to spend their time making that better? Um, and that's why I'm focused on, on this angle. If you take people whose professional expertise revolves around staying out of trouble and, you know, pretty much just that, and you put them in charge of work that only has staying out of trouble as one of its components, you're not setting up either your products or them for success. And 
we know that this isn't fine and that we need to do better. We, we Again, you know, we all know this. Um, but if we're going to change things, we have to challenge ourselves to do better. And we have to do it in a way that changes the way in which we organize and focus the work. It's customary to blame regulation for the state of affairs we're in. But I've read a lot of privacy laws and I've read even more DPA guidance and nowhere do I recall reading this needs to absolutely suck under penalty of law. A number of the problems we face in trying to improve uh, privacy come from the fact that the tech itself uh, isn't great by default and the vendors are, are often way work. But even there, it's possible to move the needle if you care. I remember this one time that uh, we were in a, in, in a long protracted negotiation with a vendor that it really was going nowhere. Um, and at, at some point, one of their people went, wait, what you're asking for is that we actually make this privacy friendly. You, you don't just want the paperwork. And they were initially confused because like no one else had ever asked. You know, people just wanted some 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 contractual terms to to, to waive. Um, but when we asked and when they understood that that was what we were asking, they could absolutely do it. Likewise, I recall a major vendor who has a product in which there's a there's a flag um, that you can use for users who are opted out of the sale of their data. And so I asked them what difference having that flag on makes to, to the service that they're providing. And it turns out that it makes none, no, no difference w w whatsoever. Um, they were just by default free riding off of, of, of you know, other people's data. And so you know, we just opted everyone out by default and called it a day. Uh, and so, you know, again, things aren't perfect. Um, you, you know, a, lot, a lot of the tech just doesn't work in a privacy-friendly way to, 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 to start with, but it's possible to get some improvements. And if your objective is just to stay out of trouble, you'll just get the paperwork and, and move on. But, you know, th there's a better way of, 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 of doing this, or at least it's possible to push the envelope. Um, and this isn't to say that the regulations are perfect. There's definitely room for, for, for improvement there. Uh, but in my experience, uh, the compliance people who most blame the regulators are also the ones who are least active in, in trying to, to improve the situation. Um, because, you know, when, when you do try to improve things, you can get some of the way there, at least. And so you, you probably won't get to perfect, whatever that means. I don't, I don't think, you know, I've ever worked on a, on a project that, that got to perfect privacy. I'm not even sure that that, that is, uh, uh, um, you know, something that could, that could happen. But you can make your products better. My experience going to product leaders and telling them, hey, have you considered that you could own privacy, hasn't been an unmitigated success. More than once, I noticed people discreetly checking to see if they could make it to the door without giving me a chance to catch them. Or they might have that attitude you slip into when you, you, you're forced to make small talk with a person telling you that, you know, the, something like the, the pyramids um, were really built as supermarkets for lizards from outer space. So you want me to manage lawyers? <clears throat> but th the truth is, there are interesting and difficult uh, problems in, in privacy law, uh, but the overwhelming majority of privacy problems that a, a website or an app will face are not legal problems. Um, they're going to be operational, um, you know, related to product design, uh, or, or, or they're going to be revenue problems. And, you know, th there's a reason I'm mostly addressing product folks with this idea. Um, had they decided to be responsible for privacy, they would already own it, right? Um, and so let's go for a few reasons to pick product people for this work rather than, say, tech or data or, 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 or anyone else. The thing is, if you put compliance people in charge of work that has a direct impact on your users, the incentives are likely to be to be wrong. At, at the end of the day, one of the ways to do compliance, one of the key ways to do compliance is to protect your company from the rights um, that, that, that your users could, could express. And in fact, there's, there's this great passage in the book uh, Industry Unbound uh, from, from um, Ari Waldman, um, in which one of the lawyers he interviews basically blurts out that the whole point of consent is to protect the company from its users and then realizes what he just said and hangs up. Um, 
you know, but privacy is intimately human, um, and it's often surfaced to users in, in, in multiple ways. And product people is precisely about, you know, product work is precisely about uh, understanding how to interface uh, with humans. In, in everyday interactions with, with other people, most of the time, privacy is so obvious um, that we don't even think about it. And understanding how humans will deal with, uh, you know, specific privacy affordances is really key to doing it well. Um, you know, and understanding how people may suffer if you do it poorly, uh, you know, including potentially m much later, uh, is also part uh, of caring about your users. And so this feels very, very product centric already. Privacy work is also deeply cross functional. You need to understand people, but also design, data, tech, um, the manner in which your product acquires new users, uh, what your revenue drivers are. Um, you need to understand long-term strategy, uh, you know, what it, what it is that you're trying to achieve with, with, with your product or products. Um, compliance is also cross-functional uh, in its touch points, but um, it isn't focused on improving people's lives. And more importantly, it is rarely concerned um, with capabilities. Uh, product people, on the other hand, are constantly interested in what could be done so that they can find new creative ways of, of developing their product further. Um, and that's that, you know, that's that that's the right attitude to have here, I, I, I believe. Um, understanding what, what could be done um, is key to solve problems in a way that that is specific to your products and, and driven by your products needs. Um, and, you know, will it will it, it, that way will naturally work better uh, for both your business needs and, and for your users. Um, then that, that's, a, that's a very different mindset, uh, a very different set of priorities from trying to align with industry practices in, in order to basically stay out of trouble. This leads us to note that assembling a privacy team for their compliance know-how is a bit like picking a restaurant chef for their hygiene inspection expertise. Uh, again, y you could be lucky. Um, you know, maybe your hygiene inspector is actually a, a pretty good cook. But, and, and, you know, it's true that some lawyers can't tell a cookie from a database, but most are, are better at it than that. And so the point is not about uh, personal competence or, or the breadth of that competence, but it's really about the focus um, that, that the, these projects have and the expectations that are placed upon people as they do their jobs. Um, and I'd like to, to, to belabor the point uh, a, a little bit, you know, not getting food poisoning is actually very, very important. Um, I'm emphatically not saying that you'll run a better restaurant without hygiene uh, or that food inspectors should, should, should be out of work. Um, I'm, I'm in fact quite happy, um, you know, that, that going for a nice meal out generally doesn't involve playing uh, Russian roulette with, with some kind of unpleasant uh, bacteria. Uh, but the, the question really is, again, you know, what you focus on. Um, your meal isn't all about avoiding contaminants and, and your privacy strategy shouldn't be all about avoiding fines. Um, we used to think that, that you know, since applications uh, require code, um, engineers should be in charge of user interface. Um, and that, that, that didn't work great and that's not generally a sound logic. Privacy is about trust, and most products really need their users' trust. A recent study shows you just how low people's trust in digital products has fallen. This is, you know, these numbers are, are quite fantastic if you're prime minister, but for anyone else, it's pretty abysmal. And the fact is, people can simply tell that we're lying to them about privacy. Imagine walking into a shop, and before you can even look at their wares, uh, a lawyer jumps out and, you know, and asks you to, to, to sign some terms. Uh, that's just a terrible experience. And it, it, it's not just that the shop doesn't trust you, it's they lawyered up levels of not trusting you. And when you signal to people that you don't trust them, they won't trust you back. It, of course, in media, the, the, the most pre precious asset um, is the trust of your readers. You, you can't ask people to trust journalism uh, if they can't trust the business practices supporting it. Um, and if you make it clear to, to your users that you're not trusting them by lawyering, lawyering up to their faces, uh, you, you're working directly against the product. Uh, now, of course, a newspaper is a special kind of product, but we all need our products to be trusted. You know, pr pretty much any product um, has to be trusted by its users uh, in order to be successful. Um, of course, you know, putting product people uh, in charge of privacy doesn't automatically mean that they'll 
produce ethical and trustworthy products. Um, uh, but at least if a product intends to be trustworthy, it won't be undermined by compliance work. So hopefully you believe me at least a little that making product owners responsible for privacy with, you know, of course, direct support from compliance colleagues uh, can at least make some sense. But it's, it's one thing to, uh, you know, to say that, that privacy is a product consideration, and it's another to make the trip um, from, from where we are to where we would like to go. And so here, uh, you know, the, the following slides are some like takeaways, uh, takeaway thoughts, at least that that I've assembled from 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 experience. I'm not claiming that claiming that they're they're hard and fast rules of any kind. That they're, they're not, you know, a compliance checklist. Um, but these are meant to help you get started down that path. Uh, you know, and even if you disagree with some of them, that's that's perfectly fine and productive. Um, but the idea is to to is to help you know figure out how to get started in, in the trenches with with this kind of like different approach. There is a phenomenon that's terrifying to watch, which is that the moment compliance people walk into a, a meeting, especially if they're lawyers, everyone else just like unplugs their brains. It's the, the thing is like people just don't want to question compliance. And frankly, people are trying to get it over with as fast as possible. You know, just like they, they, if they, the idea is if you agree to everything um, and don't question anything, then, then it'll be over quickly. Uh, the problem is rooted in the fact that compliance goals are not usually aligned with product strategy. And so they are seen as, as com you know, complete overhead that needs to be minimized and, and absolutely nothing other than that. Instead, we need to challenge habitual compliance uh, requirements. We need, uh, you know, the, the, the goal should be to make compliance a consequence of pursuing the product strategy. You probably can't do that 100%, but you can get close. Um, you know, it has to be a collaboration. Lawyers produce actionable intelligence and trade-offs so that people, that product people can, you know, make um, uh, real decisions on their own. Uh, you know, all vendors and UI should be product decisions. All user-facing copy uh, should, should involve product decisions. Uh, compliance advice should involve no fear-mongering, no relying on it's just how it's done. Um, you know, no, no needless jargon and being finicky of, of uh, whatever, you know, like data privacy, uh, data protection versus privacy or anything like that. Um, but solving this has to be two-sided. Uh, product people have to set expectations and to be open to creating a way to develop that alignment. And, you know, we need to keep in mind that compliance people uh, have no good reason to explain things well and in detail if they can tell that you're, that you're trying to get rid of them as fast as possible. If you make it clear that you expect actionable intelligence and shared decision making, uh, you can, you know, you can really understand uh, what gets to be required and then you can collaborate on finding better ways than how it's done this goes with the understanding that privacy itself isn't mystifying uh, you know in in everyday life we rarely need to think about it uh, you don't need to you don't need to feel helpless and confused in the, in the digital um, equivalent. We, we can really think from, from our, our everyday experience. Uh, and of course, there are always merchants of doubt, uh, but they're easy enough to, to, to ignore. Um, there are good books, there are good articles, but even without that, again, you know, if you try to map your, the digital situation to you know, something uh, analog in the analog world, uh, your instincts are often a very good place to start from. I was once told by someone in, working in audit that my team was the only one that invited them out for drinks now and then. And, you know, these people were friendly, they were competent, they were extremely helpful. And building that relationship really helped us figure out some complicated issues. And so, you know, in a sense, you should be putting compliance people on your product team or functionally working very directly with them, not just receiving requirements and then, then going off and, and, and trying to get rid of them as fast as possible. Uh, you, you want to have a strong enough relationship that you can, you know, simply say, yes, I know that's how everyone else is doing it, um, but how everyone is doing it is stupid. Uh, you know, let's work together to figure out how we can improve it. And well, understanding, you know, with that in mind, understanding where they're coming from um, can can really help find ways to to to, to move forward. Um, for instance, the, the the compliance perspective is often to do the same thing as everyone else, 
um, based on the, on the belief that 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 way you won't be spotted or, or, you know, if you are, you can claim that you're just following, you know, industry practices. Uh, it's supposed to be less risky, at least at least in theory. Um, I think uh, uh, that there are limits to that approach, but precisely by understanding you, you know how you can push back, right? Um, first, I, I think it's de decreasingly viable. Uh, I've seen both advocacy orgs and, and regulators um, really work um, de to develop o automated scanning. Um, and, you know, with automated tooling, the more you do the same thing as others, uh, actually, the, the easier you are, you are to spot. So it, it's, that's not necessarily great. Uh, but also, I think understanding that perspective, you can, you can explain that you want your product to be differentiated um, and that you want it to be more trustworthy than, you know, that morass of, of, of everything else. And that, that will likely require doing things uh, quite differently. And so, you know, getting to know and getting to love your, your, your compliance person um, is, is really valuable. They have, they have an absolutely essential role to play in supporting your product, and, and you can actually help make their job uh, more interesting and more valued uh, by making their problems more interesting. Um, you know, because, I mean, otherwise they're doing cookie cutter. That's, that's not wonderful either. Uh, you know, for instance, if you, if you ask them to find options uh, to do things in a way that is better for the product and, and explain, you know, what you have in mind, um, you know, getting them to focus on product user business is also something that, that's rewarding for, for, for everyone involved. Quite a few times, uh, people have come to me, you know, meeting them at, at, at privacy conferences or, or, or that kind of event and, and, and told me, I would love to improve uh, privacy on my product, but I, I really can't find the energy to fight the lawyers for it. And, you know, that, that is not a successful organization. It's not a successful focus. We can and we should be a lot more human to our users um, about how we approach privacy. And that doesn't mean, you know, you know putting some cutesy cookies uh, as ears to like Mickey Mouse your way to consent. Um, it, it, it means more thinking about the impression you're making um, uh, you know, with, 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 with your privacy affordances. It means, you know, thinking about the privacy labor. Is it your user's job to review your privacy practices or is it yours? Um, and, you know, you don't need to be an expert to understand how these things have an impact. Um, you know, you can just imagine doing uh, to people in, in real life, face to face, um, what you're doing to them via your digital product. And if it if it's really cringe, um, then it's definitely a bad a bad user experience. And most of the time, it is going to to, to be to be uh, pretty bad given today's um, today's practices. And and the thing is like this whole like trying to be human to humans uh, approach works internally as well. Um, there was this one point when I was I was working on um, an algo ethics uh, policy. It was it was just completely a draft and, and informal, um, and it hadn't been made operational in, in in any way. But people started reading it and and using it uh, anyway, and then you know they started applying it in their fund projects as well. And so I was a bit a bit surprised. And when I asked people why they applied a policy that wasn't done or that you know. That they didn't have to because they were they were working on their fund projects. They said that they they felt that in the policy, obvious human care was coming across in the way that the document was written, and and you know maybe that that came from the draft and the informal the informal tone, but that actually made them want to 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 adopt the policy. So so the the, the whole human thing is is actually quite popular both internally and externally, unsurprisingly perhaps. If you listen to digital leaders of all stripes, you know, CEOs, CTOs, etc., uh, they often just won't shut up about how important uh, data is to, to their product, to their operations, everything. And then if you look at what the products actually do, you'll, you'll gef generally see them, you know, just giving that data away to all kinds of other parties. And that's kind of like, is, it, is that data really valuable if you're giving it away? And I think that behavior comes from the mistaken impression that because data can be easily copied, um, you can just give it away to, to, to others without losing anything. And that's, that's just failing to understand the economics of, of data. Knowing uh, how your users behave, what they're interested in, um, how your product works is, is really valuable information. And being the only one to understand these things is even more valuable. Um, and if you think that that third-party data controllers uh, don't routinely reuse your data to to monetize it separately, um, and you know in ways that might 
very much compete with you, um, I hope you have a way to prove it because in, in, my, in my experience, businesses aren't just like randomly ethical out of the kindness of their hearts. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the time I've seen compliance approaches um, focused on empowering pe people, you know, businesses to share data as much as possible, uh, for basically providing a shield around, around, around data sharing. And instead, you, you should be driving this uh, from the perspective that um, if you're, if you're, understanding of, of your audience is better than, than that which third parties have, um, that's a product advantage. And so, you know, if you, if you think your data really is valuable, um, uh, act like it, you know, keep it, keep it inside, keep it to yourselves as much as possible. It, it's a common complaint that marketing will be like throwing all kinds of tracking on, onto the product. And, yeah, you know, the truth is the odds are good that you do need some of it. Uh, you know, that's that's how you sell things. That's how you acquire users. And then, well, you know, those things are, are pretty important. Um, uh, but, you know, from what I've seen at many businesses, uh, the effectiveness of each channel that, that maps to one of those trackers uh, just isn't observed much or, or, or managed. And so this means that you're really leaking data. You're sharing about your users. You know, you're, you're slowing down your product as well. Um, all for, for, for in, in some cases, for some of those channels, no business value uh, whatsoever. And that's, a, that's a pretty dumb way of approaching it. So I, I really encourage people to measure uh, as much as you can, the impact that data processing and, and, and sharing is having. And, you know, to keep those metrics updated and, and, and monitored. You know, like no one, no one likes sending data to Facebook. But at the end of the day, if that's what's driving most of your business, you really have to be pragmatic about it. And you, you want to do it in a way that is, is as right as you can make it by your users. Um, and you want to keep your eye out on, on ways to, 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 to do it better. Um, but, you know, if that's what you need to keep growing your business, then you probably have to do it. Um, but, you know, the moment the effectiveness of a channel, you know, that channel or, or, or any other drops beneath a, a certain threshold, then you should kill it with joy. And, you know, you should have the, the relationship with, with your, your, your marketing colleagues that is such that they will learn to also kill um, that, that, that channel, that tracking w with joy. And, you know, it's easy to just like blame marketing because they're the people who have to do it in in today's in the way that 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 digital um, uh, the digital sales and and, and user acquisition um, are, are are done today. But it's the same rules should apply to internal teams. You know, instead of being data pack rats, which you often you often see from from data analysts, it's important to build a culture of pride in not needing data to provide the same analysis. And again, uh, that's something that you can measure, and it's something that that is a lot easier to, to, to lead from a product culture than for compliance reasons. It's not just that honesty is the best policy, it's also simply that it works. Um, you know, way back then, um, when I wrote in public about how the New York Times approaches privacy, I was, I was pretty clear that we weren't perfect at all. Um, I explained what we were doing, why, and why some things were, were hard to, to, to improve. Uh, but when it was published, I was terrified. But pretty much immediately, the feedback was incredibly positive. Over and over again, people told me how much, you know, being open about imperfections uh, made them feel greater trust in, in what we were doing. And, you know, others in, in media and tech reached out many, many times to say how much they wished they could do the same. The truth is they can. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's a particularly amazing piece, uh, but it's it's still referenced today and it's included in, in syllabi and all, so, all kinds of things. And simply because it, it, it's an honest piece and, and, you know, in this space, honesty has become fresh and surprising. And, you know, uh, similarly, when when we worked to make the privacy policy readable and presented it in a, you know, in the kind of layout that it doesn't make you want to gouge your eyes out, which is no longer the case, unfortunately, um, it, it was really hard work for, 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 for Privacy Council at the time and, and the, the writer who was involved in it, um, you know, to, to collaborate, to make that happen. Um, and I was, I was kind of worried that all of that, that hard work would come to nothing because, you know, no one would notice, you know, no one, no one reads privacy policies, supposedly. And that's why I was, I was actually stunned um, to receive spontaneous feedback, like really spontaneous feedback from people I'd never met, um, uh, you know, on, on the internet who were thankful for just how easy 
and and you know honest and and forthcoming that the the, the privacy policy was uh, it probably wasn't that many people in total but it, but it worked right and every bit of the experience uh, helps hey, this is almost trite but just like for everything else don't don't go for perfect you know you want you want to be iterating um you want to develop a sense of where you're going like some kind of privacy strategy um that uh produces compliance mostly as a side effect, as, as I was saying earlier, uh, but that is really grounded in, in, in product goals. And, you know, a, a good example, but it's just one example of, of that kind of privacy strategy, um, you know, might have three legs. You know, first, you should aim to be the sole controller of your user's data. You, you should be the only responsible party, sort of like a Vegas rule. You know, what happens on your product stays on your product. And that really supports your users and it, it gets it's get as close as possible to to to, to getting as close as possible to it um, can really help support your your product from a business standpoint. Um, second, you really want to measure um, the 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 impact of your data usage to make sure that you're you're not processing data that doesn't support a real business impact. So this is basically like data uh, minimization but on steroid. Uh, and 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 the third leg of 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 that kind of um, of what might be a, 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 a privacy strategy could be like to strive to only process uh, and share data that um, that you would be comfortable uh, explaining to people to to their faces like directly, um, you know, without without resorting to industry tropes like like a value exchange. And so, you know, this kind of of, of, of strategy gives you a, a north star to, to aim for and inform can inform every decision in a way that's again grounded in grounded in product. And you know, you've likely never shipped a product that was that was perfect on your first iteration or even on the you know two hundredth iteration. And this isn't different. Um, and so, you, you don't want to get stuck on absolutes uh, because those those uh, those prevent progress. But but you can really have a product led. Uh, objective um, that helps you iterate towards good. In, in some jurisdictions, you can get into legal trouble um, if you don't provide an accessible experience. And that's, you know, that's definitely something that is a motivator for some companies. But in general, accessibility work is rarely driven by, by the legal department or by, by a compliance team. Uh, product teams, of course, rarely do enough accessibility, but still, um, you know, it's understood pretty much by everyone to be a user facing concern and making a product accessible sits squarely with product. Um, you know, it, it, basically the world of accessibility hasn't let the compliance discourse um, take over. And I think that's in part because of the excellent work that the Way Project has done over the years advocating for accessibility and pro producing standards for it. And we need a lot more of this. And so we, we, with others, um, I've been working on trying to replicate that work to some degree uh, for privacy. And, and, you know, there's currently a draft on, on the basic principles that, that we're about to, you know, we're about to start prodding people uh, into commenting more uh, as we as we slowly prepare to make this uh, an official standard. So, you know, please read it and tell us what you think, uh, because I, I really believe that that global standards can 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 help us uh, here. There are plenty of things that are legal but unsafe. Um, you know, I have these cooking pans that look great. They're eco-friendly, no bad materials involved. Um, but they have these totally dumbass uh, metal handles that all but guarantee uh, regular burns. And, you know, this is sort of a, it's just a small thing in my own kitchen, doesn't matter. But data is way more dangerous than that. And digital tools can be way, way more dangerous than that. And your users don't understand the risks. And you shouldn't hide behind the fact that they might have consented or that what, you, what you, you're doing is something you think to be, to be compliant. The law, really, the law really is a floor um, and not a, not, a, not a ceiling. And the safety of your product is, is re really your, your job. Um, you know, here in, in the U.S., there are bounty hunters um, looking for women seeking uh, information about abortion in states in which it is no longer legal. And you can use the ad tech stack to do that. Um, you know, so that is something that, that we people who work on these products must protect our users from. And many products that you integrate into a site or app just don't provide the service, but also sell the data to brokers. And you don't know who those brokers uh, are, you know, when the, the, who they then resell it again to. And, um, you know, th this, this can then be used for all kinds of nefarious purposes, like, for instance, going after undocumented migrants. So, you know, designing for safety 
includes privacy and is a core product concern. And I won't go into, into details here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the closing keynote that, that will cover that later. But this too um, makes privacy a, a, a product concern very much. I swear they didn't make me say this, but you know, it, it, it's really true. Um, if you can engage with regulators uh, d directly, my experience in doing so in different countries has always been positive and, and, and friendly, and I've learned a lot of interesting things uh, along the way. And again, you know, I think it, when you engage with regulators, it's important to do that uh, with a much broader perspective than that of pure compliance. I, I know that some people have a, a really cynical perspective on, on regulators, but the truth is that they're, you know, they're not trying to create bureaucratic make work and unusable experiences and unreadable notices. In my in my interactions, they've they've always been interested in the in the holistic um, experience and are, are really curious to hear what works and, and what doesn't. But the problem is. If all the feedback they hear is from people who approach privacy from a purely defensive, uh, bureaucratic compliance perspective, um, they're not going to be supported in, in making your lives easier, uh, you know, if you're trying to build better things for people. Um, they should be hearing from your product, from your business, and ideally a lot less from, from, from your lawyers. Uh, you know, for instance, I, I've had conversations with people who work um, for regulators in, in multiple jurisdictions uh, about using the, the global privacy control, GPC, or, or, or its cousin, the, the ADPC, um, to enable people to express rights in a way that works under both regimes that, that are like, you know, similar to California and, and those that are similar to, to, to the GDPR. Um, and, and this could make people's lives a lot easier and you know it would help eliminate uh, third-party data controllers which we should you know no one needs that um and you know at no time did did anyone uh, involved in, in in regulation say "Ooh, but you're not a lawyer um on the contrary what i heard was like "Ooh, you know about how browsers and standards work and you've deployed gbc in a real world context we we should talk we want to hear more um and, you know, again, in, in my new position at, at, at Protocol Labs, I'm part of a data protection working group, and we're, we're trying to figure out how privacy rights can be effectively um, supported in next generation in internet protocols um, that have, you know, different properties from, from the systems we're, we're used to using today. Uh, and it's still too early to share things, but I'm actually looking forward to discussing some of the, of the, the difficult details with, with regulators. So I, I encourage you to reach out as well. So hopefully, uh, you know, this gives you some ideas about how to move forward and give, gives you hope that, that we can change things. Um, and, but, you know, more than, more than anything else, I, I'd, I'd really like to say more than any specific detail, the changing the focus um, of privacy work to be, to be grounded in, in product expectations is really what's, what's driving this. This allows you to develop a privacy strategy um, that can then uh, uh, drive towards good. And, and of course, like only very few places do do privacy work in a completely bad way. And you know, many of the uh, m many many places will do some of the th so, so, some of the right things. But my argument here is really that switching the focus and the driver from compliance to product um, really helps helps give a more solid grounding to the good things you're already doing and enables you to to, to do more. And so, you know, if you work to, to, to be responsible for all your data processing and, and, and to push towards uh, that, that, better, that better product approach, I, I think we'll be building better things for it. And so, thank you. Um, of course, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or if there's anything you want to talk about. And I hope that you're looking forward to the rest of the conference as much as I am. And I think we have some time for questions. Thank you. Indeed we do, and hopefully Robin now joins us uh, for some uh, for some Q&A. Um, I must say I was particularly impressed by all the costume changes and the way you were flying around the room in the, in the talk, Robin, so thank you for that great work. Um, turning to chat, we've had a couple of questions about whether sessions are going to be recorded. Happy to confirm that, yes, we are recording these, and we'll email you a link to those recordings after the event. Robin, we've got a couple, only a couple of minutes, but I want to cherry pick a couple of questions that I think are, are really interesting. I'm gonna bring two together. We had a question or a comment from Bethany saying that, you know, you can work really hard on access on readability of privacy notices, but the jargon we have to use increases the score every time. And then Atusa says, well, how do we ensure that those privacy notices are easily understood when there is this checklist of requirements we need to have? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you probably cannot get to 
uh, you know, it, it, something that that is that is trivially readable by, by everyone. Um, but I, I, the process I've seen work is to really have um, uh, you really want to put a writer and a lawyer in the same room, pushing back against one another and collaborating and iterating on things. And yes, there is jargon, but nothing prevents the jargon from being explained in in plain English. Um, and I, I totally realize that that some regulatory requirements uh, really don't help. Every time I see the DPP recommending layered consent, I I I, I you know I, I get I get I get you know panic vibes because that that really isn't isn't going to work. Um, but I really think bringing bringing a writer in the mix, bringing in someone whose job it is to explain complicated things um, that they might not be an expert in in um, can, can really help. They will you know. I'm not saying you'll get to perfect, but again, they can they can spot you know a few pieces of jargon that they can simplify, and even just doing a little bit of that can go a long way. Absolutely, I, I love that point. I, I would personally, I'd love to see more content designers involved in this discussion because they can mediate, right? They can be the bridge between those two worlds um, in a way that perhaps the the two other parties might struggle with. Um, yeah. Duncan asks, how can we combat the notion that privacy is sometimes seen as like a double cost? Right. First, because it can sometimes cost more to implement this stuff, at least when done well. I, it's not always the case, but you know, it, it certainly can cost more. And second, then the idea that it sometimes leaves revenue on the table because you can't monetize the data or uh, or the targeting or whatever. So, how do we combat that uh, that objection to this kind of work? I, I I think that's that's a very good point and 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 a very important um, issue issue to address. Um, and really, the idea is to work. I mean, that, you know, what, one approach that I think works is to work as early uh, as possible to make privacy directly part of the of the of the product um, of the product strategy itself. The thing is, if privacy is seen as something that is external to what you're trying to achieve uh, with the product, you're going to get this this effect that it's always seen as a hurdle, something you have to get rid of, something you have to clear in order to keep pushing for for your product roadmap. But if it's part of the product roadmap, then it's not seen as a cost. It's seen as, as an enabler of your continuation. In terms of revenue, it's a, it's a similar problem. It's basically, you know, shedding, uh, you know, sharing data um, it tends to uh, enable you to make, um, you know, short-term, um, it gives you short-term benefits in, in terms of revenue, but it really hurts you in the long term. The more you share your data, the more people can compete with you based on that data. And that's exactly what's happening. Um, you know, when you share your audience information with third parties, those third parties re-monetize that information elsewhere. Um, you know, when, when, when Facebook, you know, if you're running a shoe shop, uh, sure, the, the fact that you're giving them data might help um, them target people for your ads, for your shoes, but it also helps them target uh, data for your competitors. And so, you know, really driving a long-term revenue strategy um, uh, can can help with the revenue part. So I would say yes, it's basically two parts. You want to make it part of your of your product strategy so that it's seen as something that can push your product data. forward, and help. you want to make it part okay. of, of you want you want you know your business leaders to understand that long-term uh, sharing data is detrimental to to to, to revenue. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then the final question for now from from Livia. Um, have you got any examples of how product people have made concrete metrics for success for this uh, that go beyond just, you know, are we complying, yes or no? Um, it, yeah, that, that, so that, that is hard because you would want, you would want user-facing metrics. So, so and that those, those are expensive to get. So um, one thing that I've seen deployed is to actually measure your user's trust in your product over, over time. And you can see that by making privacy affordances um, better, uh, you 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 actually are improving improving trust. It's not something that you, that will take you know. It's not something you'll move over two weeks. It'll take it probably several quarters. But you can see you can actually see the the the, imp the impact of, of of better affordances. So that so that that's one. Um, in terms of things that are easily measurable, you can always still get how much data you're sharing, um, how readable uh, things are. You can do A/B testing. In, and and then you know pop up questions to people um, in in terms of you know to ask them how how, how they felt about about different uh, different dialogues. I know that what one thing that is really important to 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 understand is that um, and I, I've repeated that in the talk and I'll keep repeating it probably for for many years to come. 
is that trust really has an impact. Um, it's hard to measure, but it, it really does. Um, uh, when when the, the the New York Times and this is this is like something that that's been discussed in in, in a number of public articles. When the the New York Times started its uh, first party um, data project, um, they actually asked people to voluntarily you know give more data that they said this is just to improve our advertising we're only asking you to do this to, to improve our advertising and honestly my expectation was that most people would say no they'd be like what <laughs> I'll, ne I'll never do this and and it was really easy to decline you really didn't have to volunteer for it um but a lot of people did volunteer for it um because uh there had been all this work ahead of it to make sure that people would trust that 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 you know would would would, would trust the the, the the system so if you can measure trust with surveys uh, and with interactions, um, then then I think that that's a good that's a good needle to be moving. Real, thank you. Uh, I think we probably need to wrap it up there. So many thanks for joining us, Robin Virgin.